Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to another installment of the Media and Innovation Labs Digital Mental Health Series. I'm so delighted to have you here. My name is Dr. Aziz Estatius here at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And we're just so delighted, um, but a little bittersweet, only because um, this serves as our final installment in our digital mental health mini series. And we have a wonderful, wonderful um, presenter and a wonderful person speaking with today. But before we begin, um, just wanted to share a little bit about who we are as the Media and Innovation Lab. And so in many ways, when we recently came to the University of Miami, we believed that in many ways we wanted to create a research lab and center that was unique. We knew that we needed to, in many ways, reimagine academic medicine and healthcare across five core verticals. And so in many ways, what we want to do is we want to be able to serve you, right? We want to be able to serve you. And we want to do so in a very meaningful and intentional way. And so we believe and we have committed ourselves to you, the public, that we want to ensure that we're providing the best health information. We how well we're disrupting education. We want to create the next generation of innovators, not just in medicine, but throughout. We want to also improve how we conduct research where we can have research that we include folks from the community as opposed to us as researchers and clinicians um, sit in our ivory tower, telling you and dictating how we want to help you. Instead, we want you to help us in this process. It's a journey together. And we want to also disrupt how we provide clinical care, making it more precise and more personalized. And we want to ensure that these academic settings like the University of Miami are filled with bustling innovation and energy to spin new ideas out and to include new ideas through our venture vertical. And last but not least is our service and our outreach vertical, where we want to restore the covenant that we have with you, the public, as researchers and scientists and clinicians. So we are here to serve you. Our vision for the service and outreach is to engage and to educate and to serve the global community. And I want to underscore that because I know that we have many folks tuning in today, not just from North America, but globally as well. And we welcome you all. But we want to ensure that we want to serve this global community about health innovations and so that we can together be co-creators. Um, and better consumers of technology. And that's why we created this digital mental health series, where we've realized that this past two and a half, three years, where COVID has turned our lives upside down and right side up, that we realize that we need to do more for you, the public. And so what we've said is that we want to ensure that we bring the best minds, the best solutions, best companies, to bring new and innovative solutions and ideas to your fingertip. And as I said to you at the outset, we have a doozy today. Um, to get today, we would like to welcome my very dear friend and mentor, Dr. Helen Egger, who is the um, co-founder and chief scientific officer of Little Otter. Helen, welcome. welcome Excuse me, thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this and you know, so excited about what the mill is doing. And, you know, you and I share this passion for how technology can actually transform how we care for the mental health of people, for kids and for parents and for everybody. Well, thank you so much. We're just so delighted. Our team has been looking forward yeah. to this moment for the last few months. And in many ways, you know, I think one of the things that I love about your career and your journey, and I don't think not many people know this, but we want to give you the opportunity is to kind of walk us through 
the birthing and the origin of Little Otter. And I think, you know, it's very unique um, <laughs> because I want people to recognize and realize that, that you have come through being a clinician and being one of the top scientists in America in this space, and you've made this transition. So can you just share a little bit, please, about this yes, journey? Absolutely. Well, you know, I think I'll tell you how we end or how the beginnings of Little Otter. But one thing I say is that my life's mission and commitment is the same. It's been the same since the beginning. So I'm a child psychiatrist and I specialize and focus on early childhood mental health. So kids zero to six years old. And so as a research scientist, I was at Duke University for about 20 years. I built a, a developmental epidemiology research lab. And what that really means is looking at kids in the community and trying to understand what does mental health look like? What are the factors that cause challenges and what happens to kids over time? And, you know, when I started, people literally made jokes about early childhood mental health. I mean, when I wrote my first grant, people would say, are you going to put babies on couches and, you know, things like that. But, you know, I think one of the lessons that's really reflected in the company that we're building is when you do really good science and do it carefully and in a stepwise manner, you have the opportunity to make contributions that can change what we know and what we do. And so that's really, so I developed the first structured diagnostic interview to assess mental health symptoms in kids two to six. And that was, you know, really important because we didn't have a tool and it's now translated into 15 languages and it's sort of the gold standard in the field. So that was my beginning of working in my group, but then with colleagues around the world on what does mental health look like in little kids? And what we found, which has been replicated many times, is that children two to six years old have the same rate of impairing mental health disorders as kids at other ages. Wow. Now it has a somewhat different pattern of what challenges present, but the take home message of that is, it's not that little kids are at risk for later problems. They already are suffering and it's already impacting their development. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that we identify those challenges and give kids treatment early. But of course, there's the other part, which is we don't want to just identify mental health problems and treat them. We want to prevent them. We want to identify the early signs so that we can give children help. So that's a really big part of my work. And I know you and I share this, that it's about the whole continuum of mental health, not just about mental health disorders. So I did that. I ran the child division at Duke. You know, so I've been in academia up until a year ago for 30 years. Wow. And then most recently, and this is where we had the opportunity to meet and become colleagues, I was chair of child psychiatry at NYU Langone, an amazing department, um, big department, 140 faculty, and just um, amazing expertise. And I also had a digital health lab there called the Wonder Lab, because I, like you, have been interested in the question, how do we leverage technology that has changed and transformed so many different areas of our lives? How do we use that in data science and bring that to mental health? And in my case, to you know early childhood mental health. So then the big question is, wow, why did you leave tenure? <laughs> You're endowed chair and, um, you know, being chair of a department to take this leap to do a startup. Yes. And, and that's that I think when you say my career has been unusual, I think it was pretty traditional up till about a year ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and so why why did I found Little Otter? Now, first yes. I want to say I founded Little Otter with my daughter. Mm. Well, let's just stop there because any opportunity to do something with your amazing daughter or your child is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So that I just wanna start there. And really I had had this vision for a 
digital child mental health company that was really powered by technology and data. But I realized I'm the expert in medicine. I'm the expert in science, but I'm not in the expert in technology or building companies. And so my daughter, who majored in computer science, was at the company Palantir, working all around the world. And then the 20th employee at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where she built and led their infectious disease division. Uh, in January of 2020, we were talking. She said, Mom, I think I'm the person to do this with you. Wow. And that was the turning point because I needed that partner. And when we'll talk about, and I think this is something really reflective yeah. of what we're building at the mill, just us as scientists and doctors or academics or clinicians, we can't do this on our own. We have to have tremendous respect for the fact that progress will come by bringing this expertise, and I'll include the expertise and insight of families as well. This is not just the expertise of academia, but we have to also then bring the best in terms of people who know how to build products, yes. who know design, who know data science. And that's, I truly think it's one of the things that sets Little Otter apart because we have the best sort of top quality of both worlds. I will also say, I think a thing that sets us apart, yes. there aren't that many founders who are um, doctors or psychologists, or there's some, but I also clearly am bringing my depth of experience, again, not just in science, but I've run two large academic centers. And, and so, and I think that, We've seen a lot of the challenges now happening in digital health. Yes. And um, and I think that um, a lot of that is because they haven't had actual mental health experts at the top. Yes. No, I think this is so first of all, thank you and congratulations. Yes. I think there is so much to celebrate. Yeah. I mean, I think making that transition from um, a scientific, academic, clinical background and taking that leap of faith should be commending on the fact that you did it with your daughter. And I know her well, she's super brilliant and so talented. Um, she has been featured in Rock Health, you know, in terms of her pioneering work um, and the fact that you were able to do it together. And as you rightfully pointed out, there are not a lot of female founders and there aren't a lot of investments. You know, if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I think yes. that's unique it's, in many ways. If you could just- I think that's, that's a really important point. That is something I'm really proud of. And so Rebecca and I founded Little Otter. I left and made this leap because I truly believe that we needed to be out in the marketplace um, yes. to be able to raise the money and attract the talent to create a scalable uh, early childhood mental health company that could be transformative. That the digital health work I was doing, which I'm so proud of and so proud of my colleagues with NIH funding, et cetera, it just wasn't, how do we get it out of the walls of academia? Mm -hmm. so, so, there's, so there's that, but you know, we knew going into this, there are a lot of headwinds. So it turns out that 2% of venture funding goes to companies founded by women. Mm. And it's fewer for people of color. Yes. Something like 14% go to companies that have a woman founder. So I think that, you know, Rebecca and I, I mean, so so far we've, through our A round of funding, we, we started, um, raised our pre-seed round in May of 2020. Um, and we closed and we did a seed and closed on our A round in January. So we've raised a total of $26 million in the last 18 months. And, you know, in September of last year, we had 10 employees and we have 70 employees now. Wow. So it's, and that is another piece of it. Why I took the leap is I started 
and it's just different. There's different things that are going on in academia. It's yes. speed is not, it's not the, you know, focus, but I needed things to move faster and to yes. get done faster. And that's one of the, the great things about doing this company is because we were able to raise these funds. And I will say we have incredible investors yes. who really understand what we're doing, who believe in us. And we have an all woman board and we um, purposely chose to work with investors who have a track record of working with women and people of color and who have a track record of collaborating closely with the companies they invest in to support their growth, not just to tell them to grow faster and make more money, but really are committed to the vision. And that takes time. I agree. And, and you know, just to our audience, the reason why I asked Dr. Egger to, to speak about just this journey is because I think there are some folks who are out there who might be in a very similar position. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we truly believe in is role modeling, just seeing it being yeah. done that people yeah. who, like yourself, Dr. Egger, who are a fantastic blend of brilliance and science and passion and vision, can really put that all together and galvanize and create a movement to tackle something big. Uh, and, and I would really agree. And I, I will say, I think there's another really important piece. So if I'm sort of sharing about my journey yeah. for others is, of course, my professional um, life and expertise is a foundation of Little Otter. But it all Little Otter also comes from my personal experience as a yeah. mom. Yeah. So I have four children. My daughter, who's the CEO of Little Otter, is my oldest. And I have a second son. And then our, our third child was identical twins, which yeah. is amazing. Um, so I have four kids all together. But my second child, when he was 13, became acutely ill, which with very significant mental health symptoms, psychotic symptoms that turned out to be a rare autoimmune brain mm -hmm. illness, which he, you know, has had, he's done well, but anyways, it started our journey and my journey as a mother with a child with a serious illness. And there are two things that led to Little Otter. Yeah. One, my kid is alive because I was his mother. I was mm -hmm. attending at Duke and I was able to figure out what he needed and get him. And it's not okay that everybody doesn't get that. Yeah. But number two, I had an experience as a mom in the medical system and the way often that parents are dismissed or not heard. And so that's really why Little Otter, you know, we provide digital mental health care to kids zero to 14, but we take a whole family approach very much because we know from our experience, my son's illness impacted all of us yeah. and his healing and his care needed to be involved with the care I needed and my husband and my other children. Yeah. But we also say, and this is so important, parents are the experts of their children. Yes. So we as experts in psychiatry or whatever it is, we're partners. We're yes. there together to partner. And so I guess what I'm saying in terms of people who have visions and ideas, it's not just about the idea or the thing you're going to build. For me with Little Otter, it's how I want to connect with families, how I want families to feel never to feel ashamed mm -hmm. or criticized or closed out. And so, you know, we can bring our whole selves when we are creating and seeking to create something new. And that's why startups are awesome because they never existed before. So yes. you don't have anyone saying, but wait, we don't do it that way. And exactly. Like, oh, actually we do. Exactly. And I love that. And, and I love how that segue is nice because, you know, our next topic, because I think in many ways, I think you are tackling the huge mental health, particularly youth mental health crisis. Yeah. And so if you could just lay that out for us and how the, 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 the current traditional approach to healing and care, you know, forced you in many ways to say, hey, let me create a new paradigm, a new way of doing business, because I think that will 
show folks how unique this paradigm is. So yes, little Otto uh, yeah. is pushing this forward, but I want to hear how are you yeah. inventing things in that well, way? Well, it's so I'm sure everybody has been hearing me. It's been top of the news, the youth mental health crisis. Although I think there's been more of a focus on teenagers and the yeah. truth is this is spans from early childhood. Onward. The first thing to realize is we had a child and youth mental health crisis before the pandemic of yeah. huge proportions. Yeah. So, you know, when I started in the field 30 years ago, we knew that 20% of kids have an impairing mental health disorder. 80% do not get mental health care. That number has not changed. Wow. Okay. So we, despite the fact of incredible, we know so much about child mental health, we actually have great treatments for child mental health. So it's not because we don't know what to do. It's really because we have, I mean, there are a lot of reasons. A big reason that children aren't getting mental health care is because we have a completely broken system of mental health care. And I think that's incredibly important for people to realize that it's it's a really a huge challenge to even get access to care because people are full. Well, why don't people take insurance? Because insurance companies reimburse providers at incredibly low rates and do, I mean, we can talk about the whole insurance piece. Yeah. But I think there's there's another piece of it, which is I think we have a crisis in access to care yes. for sure. And and we're never going to solve that by training more people because mm -hmm. to give you an example, 72% mm -hmm. of the counties in the United States do not have one child psychiatrist. I know. Yep. And there are states that have zero or one child psychiatrist. So yes, we need to train more people. Absolutely. But we are never going to meet this huge gap. And that's really why, you know, I think telehealth is critical. It's why I founded a digital health company and really coming up with, and I'll share with you some about how yeah. we approach, you know, the screening and stuff like that, like better and more efficient ways to identify kids who need help and make sure, I said this in a, a trend, I created something at Duke called the Integrated Pediatric Mental Health, which yeah. really transformed our care and had a single point of entry. And what we said our goal was, it's, and I think this should be our nation's goal, our global goal, Yes, yes. getting the right child to the right place at the right time. Amen. Right? And, and that is, is really um, a huge part of it. And But here's another part that is really what we're building at Little Otter. Yes, we are providing, you know, amazing mental health care. But really, I want to be there for parents to answer the question, when should I worry? Yes. Because we don't, we don't know. This is not a shared knowledge. So the example I give is my three-year-old's having a temper tantrum in the middle of Whole Foods and, you know, bit me. Is this normal yeah. and if and it may well be you still need advice you yeah. still need guidance right but per, but it turns out there's sometimes and this is my work that yes i call certain frequent aggressive tantrums i call them early childhood mental health fevers mm. they don't tell you what is wrong but like having mm. a fever it's a warning sign that we need to look a little deeper. We need yeah. to go in, get more information. So, so I think our mental health crisis, this is so important. It's not just about, can you get an appointment? It really is around education and empowerment of everyone who cares for children, parents, pediatricians, teachers, community leaders, that they know what the signs of a child who's suffering are, and then have access to knowledge about what to do, right? It's not enough to know there's a problem, but what do I do if I identify that? I love that. And it really, as you said, 
a lot of what Little Otter is doing it reflects, you know, the vision and mission of what we're doing here at the mill. You it know, does. we created the, the stem cell program um, where we're going all throughout the state of Florida mm. to identify kids who may have, as you say, these little fevers, but we're doing it through, you know, social and emotional learning. And I think yeah. you're right that more folks need to be taking a more proactive, you know, you know, kind of stance. Um, in, and they in need the tools. Exactly. That's the thing. I mean, I think, it, yes, I mean, we were... I was talking to Jessica you yeah, know, yeah. about an article that said people should watch out for mental health problems in their kids. And I'm like, what? Do you know what you're watching for? Exactly. They don't. And, then, and we do tend to take this wait and watch view, particularly in early childhood. People will say, oh, you know, your four year olds having a problem. They'll be like, well, come back in six months. And I'm like, that's one eighth of this child's life. Wow. We're going to wait to yeah. figure out if there's a problem? No, 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 no. And so, you know, that it's both identifying when the problems are, but also a lot like what I was privileged to have when my son was sick, give parents and those who care for children the tools to advocate, yes. the tools to say, this is what I need. Like, and to say, and if someone says no, to say, no, 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 actually, I know what I'm talking about. Yes. This is what my child needs and have have data that they will say, yes, this is a problem rather than it's just my hunch or my feeling. Thank you. So, so Dr. Egger, this is fantastic. I, I love that. But I'm going to play Angel's Advocate. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, um, so, so I'm a single dad or a single mom with yep. kids and I don't have the network of, you know, friends and family who are in, you know, um, medicine. Yeah. And and I get inundated with all these different resources coming. Right. Out. Right. When you see that, can you just share a little, or maybe it's maybe through, you know, a demoing of how, you know, little, yeah. other, you know, kind of tried to solve this point of entry. But you you, you highlighted something I think which is so wonderful where. You know, sometimes, you know, as clinicians and as scientists, we think we want to go in and just help in a parent right away. Right. And, and to intervene for them. And, and essentially what you mentioned is some parents are just worried and concerned. That's and right. How do you how do you deal with yeah, that? Yeah. Well, and, and that is so important. So the first piece, I am going to show a demo that is sort of how we're solving this at Little Otter. You have to know that you can trust the source. Mm. of the information. And to me, that's the biggest problem right now with yes. Googling, yes. because you'll get a lot of information back, but how do you know? And usually it's conflicting, right? Yes. How do you know what to choose? So, you know, what we are building at Little Otter, we want to be that trusted source yes. because we, number one, everything we're building is based on evidence and science and experience. Number two, we're really different than a lot of other mental health companies, which um, sort of have therapists as contract workers. Mm -hmm. And I call it kind of the Uber therapist, like pick up an hour or two here. We do not do that at Little Otter because we can't provide the quality of care by doing that. So our providers are full time plus, which means they get full benefits and other things. So it's not a sort of a gig job, yeah. but really because we do weekly supervision, case conference, ongoing learning, didactics. So with the recognition that if we're going to be a trusted source, every single person who is working with a family needs to have the knowledge and the skills that is top quality mental health care. So that's, you know, a really amazing, you know, but it also is why we can attract great providers because yeah. we work collaboratively as a team and you have peers and you can learn from each other and because it can be very isolating. Yes. Right. To, to do, um, to provide mental health care without having people to support you. So the thing I wanted to show you all. Yeah, I would love to see. I think well, I'm just going to show you one little piece of what we're building. And yeah. what this is, I'm going to, it's um, part of our app. But what I've created is 
called the Child and Family Mental Health Checkup. And it is a um, series of questions I'm going to show you that folks answer, and then they immediately get a personalized report with an interpretation of what we found, and then what can you do? And to me, this is so important in answering that question of the single mom yes. or the not single mom who doesn't know, should I be worried or not? If I want to ask a question, I want information back as quickly as possible and to have confidence in what it means. So here, these are just the intro screens to our app. Now, so for the checkup, people do it first when they come in, um, when they register at Little Otter, and then we repeat it every three months. So it's just like you take your child to the pediatrician and you do height and weight. Why don't we have that for our children's social, emotional, and behavioral development? So we true. need to have that. So I'm going to show you uh, what we do, but I wanted to be clear that what we create for children needs to be developmentally sensitive. So for the child mental health section of the checkup, I have a separate one for infants, zero mm -hmm. to 11 months, toddlers, one and two year olds, preschoolers, three to six year olds, school age children, seven to 14. And again, that's what's, you're not gonna give advice about a 14 year old that you're gonna give about a two year old. And that's another thing that I'm really proud of of what we're doing. So here, these are just uh, the intro screens. Let me get over here. And then this is what we call our care den. We love all of our otter language and it turns out <laughs> otters live in care dens. Um, and this is where you see all your information, but I'm gonna show you about our checkup. And I'm making this a lot shorter. I'm not doing the registration. But the first thing is we wanna hear about your worries. We've pre-populated this with two children, so Grace. You could then do it for your next child, but also your worries for yourself and your worries for your family. So everything we do at Little Otter is child, parent, family, never any one thing in isolation. Great. And this is starting the checkup. Think about it like a trip to your mental health pediatrician. And here uh, we start, we can do multiple children, but this is starting on grace. And so first, we ask about the child's emotions and behaviors. And as I said, these sections are different depending on the age of your child. This is just an example of a question. Then the next section, oh, I skipped the preview thing, is we look at the impact that the child's emotions and behaviors are having on the child, having on the parent, and having on the family. Because thats it's not just about symptoms. It's like, can your kid go to school? Yes. Does your kid have friendships? Can they get their academic work done? Then the last section is about the, um, no, the second section is about the parents. So we screen for anxiety and depression because if a parent has a mental health challenge, that's gonna have a huge impact on the child's mental health. And then lastly, we look at the family. So first we look at the level of stress. Then we look at your relationship with your partner if you have one and your relationship with your co-parent if you have one. So all of this information, once you complete it, okay, you complete it and immediately you get your, wow. um, this is the report and the checkup. Wow. And so at the top, it has a summary. We divide things into concerning or typical. Nice. This shows you the overview for your family. But then shows you your worries. We also do your child's superpowers because it's about strength. Yes. But then we say, okay, so here Grace for her emotional challenges is typical. For every item we say, what does this mean? So there's information. And then we say, what can you do? So this is typical emotional. This is how to support your child's healthy emotional development. But here she's having concerning areas in behavior. We give different advice and there is that information. So this goes through the impact, gives a summary, your mental health. We give advice to the parents about how to support their mental health. 
then the family mental health, how to deal with stress, you know, et cetera. And the key thing is we do child mental health care with therapy and medications. We do parenting support when it's typical problems. We do couples counseling and we provide mental health care for parents where indicated. And all the team members that are working with a family work together to help the family and always think about the care um, as being family centered. And I, I really feel like I wanted to have the opportunity to show the report because I think it shows our approach to child mental health, but also all of the measures are evidence-based. <laughs> They're you know, valid, reliable measures, and the information is, is all uh, reliable and you know, things that people can act on. So this is something I'm really proud of. And I think, as I said, where I think we have a quality challenge in child mental health, what we're building at Little Otter is a embracing, compassionate, um, connected experience for families that uses measurement so that we have a shared understanding of what's going on. And then when you're doing an evaluation, we're clear what that is and then what the targets of our treatment are. Mm -hmm. And our field has not embraced um, much to its detriment, I think. I mean, this is a big conversation. Yes. Of, of we know that using measurement tools improve care. There's no doubt about that. But it so often doesn't happen in our care. And so what I think, and we can take down the demo now, but I think what I wanted to demonstrate is not, there are a few things about it. One, you can do questionnaires in a way that's friendly and engaging. Yeah and quick and doesn't feel clinical and cold. Number two, I think measures only work if you get the information back. So I went to the doctor the other day and they had me fill out all these things on my mar my chart thing. Nobody ever mentioned them. I have no idea what they meant. Right. Yeah. Or I come in and they ask me to do them again. That's not okay. So we think about measures as being part of our relationship. You give us, me at Little Otter, some information. I'm going to immediately give that back to you to, to tell you what, from my perspective, it means to give you my actionable insights, but it will also start our conversation. It's mm. the beginning of our therapeutic relationship with each other, right? Because then we fill that out. A measure is just, I call it the skeleton of what we're learning. And so that's, you know, the innovative, I mean, uh, we're I, building I, a platform that from um, actually delivering measurement-based care, and again, it's not just questionnaires, it's using video and other things like that, and really demonstrating that at scale, we can provide what we know is the best mental health care for That's children amazing. and families. That's amazing and congrats. Just quick question, or maybe it's a longer um, answer. Um, so once um, parents and families go through this initial screen and you know a report is provided and actionable insights are provided, can you just describe what happens next? Yes, you know, yes, absolutely. You know, Yep. So then um, we have then families sign up for what we call a welcome call. So that is a um, a call with a professional who hears more about what the challenges the family is facing. And then that person um, who is we call them parenting specialists because they're really experts in uh, parenting and children will then invite depending on what we're learning, different providers to the team. So let's say wow. that happens, it turns out the child is having depression, then we'll invite one of our therapists. And we purposely use this language. I think language is really important. You know how we usually say in medicine, we refer people out? Yes. <laughs> At Little Otter, we invite providers in. Brilliant. Because the team is not the providers. The team includes the parent 
includes the child. It may include grandma. It might yes. include. And, and so the folks, our little otter folks, providers who do our welcome call, then become the integrated care specialist, the wow. lead who, who makes sure that all the pieces of the team are working together and, and that, you know, families know that they can turn to someone if they're having a challenge or even, you know, scheduling or things like that. I mean, that's one of the things from my experience with my son, I say is, you know, cause he has lots of different doctors cause it's the nature of, of a serious illness that we expect parents to be the quarterback of the medicine. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, wait, my kid is incredibly sick. I, I, and I don't have the knowledge. I'm not a rheumatologist, blah, blah, blah. I can't be the quarterback. And so little Otter wants to be parents quarterback I'm of up. the team where we're taking the responsibility, right. For, for making sure things are integrated. But I want to emphasize a family might do the report and it might be, yeah, things are looking great. And in that case, either they can just stick with Little Otter, we have tons of resources and they can repeat it to make sure things are staying healthy, or they could work with one of our parenting specialists, not focused on a clinical issue, but on a, we cannot get Susie to bed without a yes. hour long struggle or, you know, just to the things. Very real things. Just real life, like yeah. help, help us to reduce the chaos and the conflict and to support our kids and support ourselves. So, you know, again, as I said, our goal for Little Otter is to be a, a home for every parent, not only for parents whose children have um, mental health challenges. I love that because what it does is that it destigmatizes yes. health and emotional well-being. Yes. And yes. I absolutely love that, you know, where it's very strength-based focused yes. while acknowledging that kids through for a variety of different reasons may go through, you yes. know, challenges in developmental miles, hitting developmental milestones. And you can also tackle the more serious mental health issues as well. I think that is brilliant. If you could just share with our audience because um, you said that it's a, a team, a well-integrated team. Can you just share, you know, who, you know, who, you know, who consists of this? Yeah, you know? who are our providers? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, so as I said, first of all, we're very, we've been privileged to be very picky. We go through a rigorous um, process of choosing folks. So we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, we have um, LMFTs, uh, master's level clinical social workers. We also have folks who are um, BCBAs, so trained in um, behavioral work with, yeah. with kids and with families. Um, so uh, we have nurse practitioners. We have some early childhood mental health master's level specialists. So, you know, we, we are bringing together the different um, specialties because, look, the key about mental health, it's a very multi disciplinary discipline, yes. right? Yes. I mean, and and different people in their training bring different things to the clinical uh, care system. They um, have different experiences. And so it's so important that a mental health company not be just focused on one type of training. Absolutely. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm asking you a few details because I, I can Ooh. sense in our audience that, you know, they're trying to figure out, okay, you know, when one kind of signs up for, for, you know, Little Otter, how soon does someone get in contact with them? Like, what's that process like? So, yep. So, so um, yeah, I should have shown you the longer demo. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Um, you, once you, um, I mean, you don't even have to do the mental health report to wow. sign up. You self-schedule your welcome call. And we wow. mostly have appointments next day. I mean, wow. and out. I mean, that's, again, our goal. And we have appointments to see therapists, you know, within days. Um, I will tell you one thing that we have is um, not surprising to you, but um, heartbreaking to all of us is 
so many children with uh, suicidal ideation. And so we have developed a uh, special kind of appointment. If during the welcome call, um, the um, provider learns that the child is suicidal, either that day or the next day, we do what's called a safety A appointment, which is a special evaluation and um, treatment intervention for suicidal children. Wow. So again, it what it does is it evaluates the situation, but also helps to make sure the child is safe, develop a safety plan, et cetera, et cetera. So we do see kids who are at high risk like that even faster and make sure that we're prioritizing their needs. Oh, this is great. So I know you've drawn a, a very clear distinction that you're not a telehealth company. You're using- We're not only a telehealth company. <laughs> <telehealth. laughs> uh, just curious, um, in terms of, you know, when, when, when parents or families come to you, um, are these sessions done virtually or they're done in person or based on the preference? Mm -hmm. of no, we're hundred percent virtual. And so they are all done virtually. Um, and, you know, people, that's a great thing for us to talk about because, you know, yes. all, so many of us in the field went into doing tele um, because of the pandemic. And I want to emphasize one thing about Little Otter. We're not trying to build a, the best child psychiatry digital health company, we're trying to build the best child mental health company. Nice. And so the quality of care that we deliver through, you know, through doing telehealth, we can deliver that high quality care. Now there are a few caveats I want to say. Sure. If kids are have new onset psychosis, mm -hmm. have just been discharged from an inpatient, they are not a good fit for okay. the water because we don't have that intensity of care. Yeah. Also, there's some people who would prefer to do in person and rather than digital, and we totally respect that. But I want to just tell you what I think the advantages of digital health are. Mm -hmm. Number one, we take care of people who have children 14 and under, many with very young children. Yes. And the ease of being able to do appointments in your home, you don't have to leave work, you don't have to trundle the rest of your kids, you know, in the car. And, you know, that is a huge, huge thing. One thing that from one study, just to highlight that, yeah. before the pandemic, when uh, folks were doing uh, in-person care, 5% of dads joined appointments yes. for mental health, 95% joined afterwards. Wow. So being able to have both or multiple, whoever are the key yes. caregivers joining in with the child, that's huge. So convenience is huge. As a clinician, it's really interesting. I don't know if you have this experience, mm -hmm. but you are also seeing and the person's home and yes. that yeah. child is, you know, like you can say, show me your bedroom. Yes. Oh, here are my special stuffed animals. Here yes. is my, so, so there, that is something that's so critical. I agree. It brings a level of intimacy and personalization yes. in that therapeutic process. And in, in many ways, that is absolutely true. The one thing though, that, you know, you know, just to be very mindful, since we have a global audience, yes. the fact that, you know, when it comes to access to, you know, stable, you know, broadband yeah. and internet, those are some challenges. Um, it, it, you know, how are you trying to solve some of those potential, you know, barriers? To, yeah, to well, so, so one thing we can do sessions by phone, <laughs> and sometimes people have a preference for that. Um, but, but yeah, and you can do it with your phone, your iPad, you can do it on your desktop. <laughs> But I do think that access to um, good internet is a social justice issue. Absolutely. You know, because this is the way so many uh, resources and this example of, of telehealth, 
is one of them. I mean, I also say, I didn't mention we have messaging. So anytime you can right. send a message to your clinician through our app and get answers. So, you know, uh, a digital platform provides an opportunity for asynchronous support that in-person care doesn't provide. Wow, that, that's amazing. And obviously those chats are highly secured and everything. So oh, ever, well, well, I mean, ab I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I know, just for our <laughs> No, no, that's critical. I mean, that's why we're a tech company. Yes, absolutely. Not, you know, because you need, that's critical that everything is, is safe. Yes and protected. And, and obviously you abide by HIPAA rules and all of yep. those kinds of things, fantastic. All uh, of that, of course. Uh, absolutely. I just wanna tell our audience that if you have any questions for Dr. Egger, hopefully not me, because she's okay. the expert, um, please um, type in the comment section um, and please share those um, questions. Um, so, you know, Dr. Egger, in terms of, you know, again, congrats for just you know, taking us through this tour and journey of your clinical, scientific, and your own personal life. I think that's yeah. a beautiful thing where you've, in many ways, you are inspired um, by your children in many ways, yeah. by your yeah. son and your daughter and your, and your twins. Um, can you share, where do we need to go to tackle youth mental health crisis? So I know, you know, Little Otter is adding a different paradigm. Um, and I love that. But, but how, where do you think we need to go in really addressing the youth mental health crisis, not just in the States, but, you know, globally? Everywhere, yeah. Well, yes. So there are a few things. Number one, I, we have to have some kind of universal screening yeah. because, and I think the places for that to happen are in schools and, um, and pediatric offices. Yes. But, you know, how we make that happen is something I just read a paper showing that only 30% of kids are screened for developmental disorders, screened for autism, despite the fact that's a, you know, number one recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So I think it's, we, when you think about screening, you have to know how you do it, but you have to have actions that can follow up. So yes. if you identify a child with a problem, how we're going to get them care. You know, I think there have been some positive things in terms of President Biden has invested in yes. school mental health, et cetera. But I, I think a caveat that I would have is yes. that We've invested a lot, and I think it's fantastic. Yes. In social emotional learning. That's great. But that's a universal intervention that does not treat or identify children's mental health problems. Absolutely. 20% of your kids, you have 100 kids, 20 of them are going to have a, a mental health challenge that needs treatment. So I think that it's if we instituted screening into schools, it's really also educating educators and the education yes. system about um, what mental health challenges look like. So that's one. But number two is, I mean, everyone's bemoaning the problems with child mental health. Nobody seems to be raising the rates and saying we're willing to invest so that we have more access to care. If you're an insurance company, that would be one way to do it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, I think our society has to get serious about, about kids and we're not. Yeah. And, and I mean, I will say again, I, the teenage mental health crisis is huge and is of great concern. The earlier we identify children, the more we invest in early childhood mental health, we will prevent, yes. we will prevent the things that are now happening amongst our older children. So I just, my plea really yes. from a advocacy point of view and thinking from a, what can we do is to recognize that we we can't start at age 14. 
Yes. It, it's too late. Again, we need to serve all of those children. I agree. I agree. If we're going to make a difference, we have to start early and we have to start by supporting parents' mental health. Yes. And supporting parents and giving parents paid leave when they have babies and yes. you know, support. We have to fight the stigma about mental health. We have to, we have to change our attitude about about our mental health and wellness and recognize that it's not weakness to need help, that we all need help and build our communities and, and caring about families because we just have fall, fallen short. Uh, we, we really have. And, and I think those points are very poignant, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's, it, it, we, we need to do more. And, you know, this is why, you know, for us here at the mill, um, you know, we felt that we needed to, you know, intervene and to yeah. reach educators um, yeah. and, as well as families as well. And totally, totally. Because we believe that, you know, kids are, you know, they live in homes and those, are ho those homes yeah. are nested in neighborhoods and neighborhoods as well can really provide an enriching type of environment, one, to support the kids, but also families as well. Of course. Yeah. And because I think a lot of parents feel blamed when their kids have, like, mm, it's their fault. Yeah. And I feel like that's something we have to fight against. But my dream is, you know, that we're able to take the child and family mental health checkup and give every family access to that. It's a yeah. start, right? It's not, it's not a solution, but we have to have a start that says, here's a way to at least know where you are and with some actionable insights about what you can do. Because we have to empower people. Yeah. I think a lot of times when we talk about mental health, we need to give you this, provide this. So much of it is to empower people to feel that they can get what they deserve and ask for what they need. Oh, this is fantastic. So again, folks, if you have any questions or comments for myself or Dr. Egger, please, 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 you know, chime in. Um, the one thing I would ask, and, 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 and thank you so much, I love your vision for where <laughs> we need to go um, with, you know, youth mental health and how to really, you know, um, address it head on. Can you just describe, you know, the space of digital mental health and, and perhaps a little, little otter? Where, where, where is little otter headed? Where is this digital mental health? Yeah, well, I think we're in a, um, a another phase in terms of digital mental health. I think there were some early companies that have come out with very good intentions and have done some good work and you know, there's going to never be a substitute in digital mental health for good quality care. And we know what good starts with good diagnostic assessment and evidence-based care, period. Yeah. And there's no easy shortcut for that. I mean, that that's, that's, the, that's the truth. So I think that we, you know, hopefully there's going to be a kind of a resetting where we realize there's no quick and easy answers, but yes, we are building, you know, a new way of doing things in the child space. You know, there are a lot of interesting other companies. The one I am most excited about that I think is most similar to little otter is called equip. And mm. it's a um, really fantastic company um, for treating eating disorders that that has, I think, in terms of its quality of its um, science and clinical care and its leadership, you know, I really admire them and think they're doing an amazing job. Um, I think the problem with school mental health, digital mental health solutions, and obviously that's a place, it you have to involve parents. Yes. And that is the hardest thing about school mental health because treating the child without full engagement with parents is it, it, it has significant limitations, particularly for younger children. So, you know, I don't know how we're all going to solve that, but I think we need, we need to be thinking about 
the connections between schools and families, not just schools and children. I love that. Is Little Otter or are there any resources where parents may have a support group? Um, yeah, well, we're, we don't, we have, I mean, we probably will be um, doing some support groups. We, um, I'll tease you that folks should follow our Instagram um, uh, and we're going to be um, announcing something on Monday that I think will, per, is an exciting, innovative solution for helping families in that kind of way. Um, yeah, no, you, what you're emphasizing is people need community. Exactly. And and community, knowing you're not alone, knowing that others are facing these challenges. And that's so important. And we are creating those communities in our social media also. That's fantastic. Um, Helen, Dr. Egger, my fantastic friend and mentor and role model. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, they always say save the best for last and you know, not that we, we're not going to say that because we don't want our other colleagues to, <laughs> to get upset. But no, it's, you know. it's really um, an incredible privilege and honor. And I am so excited about what Mill is doing and really hope uh, that we're going to continue not just to be connected, but collaborate because the more of us joining together, the bigger the difference we're going to be. I, I agree. We are trying to you know help build an ecosystem and to build right. a community of like-minded folks who are mission driven um, exactly. they about the real things so thank you so much to you um and your team and with yeah. that i would like to also thank our team from the media and innovation lab as well as helen's team from little otter um you know in many ways this culminates you know as i said you know our digital mental health series focused on youth mental health um, and as you know, this, um, you know, in many ways, in as much as Helen and I serve as faces for respect. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of amazing, amazing people doing the work. And that's our whole incredible exactly. team. Exactly. Little Otter and Jessica specifically. Who I know. So Jessica, I don't know if you want to come back on. And Kayla, I would like people to see you. They are behind the scenes folks. Um, so they might be a little shy, but I would like to acknowledge both Yay. of them, please, for just, you know. Um, thank you, Kayla, also, and always thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, and thank you, Jessica. And thanks to my fantastic global audience. So, again, this is just a pause on our uh, digital mental health series. You can follow us on LinkedIn, the Media and Innovation Lab and you will hear about all the fantastic things that we're doing, as well as our amazing partners like Little Otter. And so I want to thank you so much um, for being here. And thanks again to Dr. Egger for just thank sharing you. her journey and her wisdom and brilliance and insight and mm -hmm. her passion. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all and see you next time. My name is Dr. Aziz Seychelles, Director of the Media and Innovation Lab here at the U. Um, so thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.